Welcome back, everyone, to Let the Journey Begin. I am your host, Hillary Roberts, alongside my guest co-host, our executive director for the Red Songbird Foundation, Alex Meshi. Hi, Hillary. It's glad I'm glad to be back. It's good to be back, rather. Um, Brian mentioned that I had a little bit of foresight, I guess, a few weeks back, saying that I was going to be back soon, and here I am. Since uh, <laughs> Jason had to step out, but I'm glad to. Be here. We have a great guest, and I'm uh, excited to learn more about her and her story. Yeah, me too. Me too. How, how have you been? How's your How's your mom? We were just talking about <laughs> your amazing mom. Uh, my mom's been great. She's still living on the uh, the high side of our Vegas trip. I took her out there for Lunar New Year and showed her all the pretty flowers and uh, went and ate some nice seafood. That's her favorite thing to eat when I'm not cooking for her, which is never because she doesn't like my cooking. But uh, <laughs> we had a great time, you know, and uh, it was nice because uh, my mom is disabled. So walking around isn't something that's easy for her, but we were able to get her a motorized scooter and she uh, committed a couple hit and runs, you know, on the strip <laughs> running people over. But we were able to smooth things over and we didn't leave anyone upset. So overall, it was great. But she's doing well and uh kicking off the year of the ox. I can't wait to meet her. Yeah, she's great. She's looking forward to meeting you. Um, I know that because I was telling my parents that uh, you wanted to take us all out to dinner. And my dad's all excited because he kind of like worships you on social media and the fact that a celebrity talks to him. That's not Jason. And then uh, <laughs> my mom, on the other hand, is like, uh, Hillary, why does your boss want to take me out? And I'm like, well, she wants to meet you guys and, you know, kind of honor you and do something nice for you. And my mom just Maybe it doesn't register in Korean culture, but she's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> so all in all, they're doing very well and uh, they're excited to meet you and go out and have some fun. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. Well, today, today we have an amazing guest, beautiful woman. She's a celebrity. She is um, new in recovery. And I know a lot of you that are questioning if you need to be sober or if you're struggling and you're new, I think you're going to get a lot out of this today. And she, uh, she really tries to use her platform to be of service, to help people with her own experiences. She was just giving me tips because I want to have kids on what that's like. So we will see what happens with that. But I want to introduce everyone today to the beautiful Bronwyn from Housewives of Orange County. I am so happy to be here today. Yeah, thanks for coming <laughs> on with us. And I'll be a little forward in saying that I don't follow the Housewives. I don't think I'm part of that demographic that watches that show, or I don't think so. But I did look into your story a little bit that uh, I'd love for you to share some of. And uh, before we start, I want to say that you being a mother of seven and going through what I read on the internet, uh, you're a champion and a hero. Like you are a role model and I admire what you've done for your kids and telling your story about that and, you know, having seven kids to the other stuff that you've gotten into in your personal life. And it, it's like crazy immaculate what you've done and utilizing the platform as you are to spread that message of hope and provide solution in an area that I feel is very deficient because not a lot of people have the same story as you. Um, and that's one of the beauties of this podcast. And by us having this show, we're able to bring these to the table and kind of provide a megaphone to your story, because I guarantee you there's probably at least a hundred, if not more people that may be going through something similar that can definitely take away something from you. I, I mean, I hope so. That's one of the reasons I wanted to be so raw and vulnerable this past season with the story was because it does impact so many people. And when I went to my producer and said, okay, here's the truth. Cause I had right before filming said I was going on a cleanse. I knew that I had a problem with drinking. I knew I was an alcoholic, but I hadn't said that to anyone I worked with yet. And I called him and I said, I'm an alcoholic. And he was like, okay, do you want to share this on the show? And I said, I do. And I want to do it as honestly and real as possible. And I really was lucky that I had a great production company and they really supported me. And they they tried to show the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Because it was all of that, you know, those first, I think I was 12 days sober when I started filming. Um, and wow. kind of gave an accurate depiction of what early life in sobriety is like. Wow. I want And I want us to get more into that. Um, th but we we do launch off our episodes with a very... 
fun question. What did you want to be when you grew up? Okay, so here's the weirdest thing. I wanted to be a real housewife. Mm. Oh. That really was my dream. And the fact that it happened is so crazy to me still. I still have to pinch myself. So um, I obviously wanted to be a mom. I wanted to have a lot of kids. Uh, I told my husband that on our first date. I want to be a stay-at-home mom with a lot of kids. And then when Real Housewives aired 15 years ago, I was really good friends, my, uh, family friends with Gina Kehoe. And I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. That's, you know, you can be on TV. You don't have to memorize lines. Like, <laughs> the, the, you know, because I always been a theater kid, but I'm also kind of, you know, lazy. Like, I don't want to put any work. I'm like, I just, I just want to show up with a camera. Like, that sounds amazing. So I really, this is my dream job. Mm. I have my dream job. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, that's pretty crazy to have that goal come out, you know, off a show that aired 15 years ago. I didn't even know it's been around that long. Yeah. Um, so as someone that's not privy to it, how long have you been a, a, with the show? This is my, I've been on for two years. Okay. So oh. season 14 and 15. Gotcha. So happy for you. I know. It, I really did jump up and down when I got the phone call. I was like, how is this happening? This, I mean, this is a sh one in a million or t t more shot. I'm like, <laughs> So I have a question for you. When you first got the call that they wanted to put you on the show, um, what was the initial thought as far as how you were going to utilize your camera time? Was it just that you wanted to be filmed being a housewife and you know going through the craziness and the rigmarole that they do? Or did you from the onset kind of have an objective or an idea of something you wanted to use this platform for? Not at all. The first season I was on, I had just had my seventh baby and I just was looking for something of my own. I'd been a stay-at-home mom at that time for 18 years, and I wanted something else. You know, I love being a mom, but something else was missing, something for me. So I went on the show thinking, I'm going to have fun. We're going to get to travel. I'm going to meet, you know, really cool women. I've always been a girl's girl, so I'm like, everyone's going to love me. This is going to be great. We're going to have so <laughs> much fun, you know. I was imagining slumber parties and dinner. Like, I was so naive. <laughs> I, I really was. Um, and so, no, I didn't go in with any ideas or platforms or things to sell or nothing. I just went in thinking I'm going to be myself. I'm going to have fun. This is great. So being newly in recovery and having this platform, uh, we don't exactly have a lot of guests that are in a similar situation. The only other person I think we've talked to would be Jason that kind of had his early recovery being depicted on a show and or, you know, the before and afters uh, with Jason, we saw a lot of the uh, the low points, you know, on the first time around the hills and also on Laguna Beach, where he really got inundated into his addiction. Um, how did the show affect uh, your recovery? Because you're recently sober. I believe you got about a year now, right? Yeah, a little over a year. So. Right before filming the first season for me, season 14, I just weaned my baby and I did it because I knew we were going to be filming. So I had had seven years of not drinking because of pregnancies and nursing. I had been to uh, rehab and I tried to get sober two other times in my life. And my alcoholic brain was like, you just had seven years of not drinking. You're fine. And when we started filming, Alcohol is sort of like another cast member. It is so readily available. It's there. You walk into a scene. I was nervous, especially in the very beginning. The first thing I would do is grab a drink. Obviously, I don't drink like a lot of people. You know, one drink is never one drink. So before I knew it, I was five in. Mm. Um, and it kept progressing through the season. Um, and I was playing it off like, oh, I've been a stay-at-home mom. I've been nursing. This is my time to let loose. I didn't want anyone to know I had a problem. This is this is fun, Bronwyn. This is crazy, Bronwyn. I earned this. Mm -hmm. And as the season was going on, it it was getting unmanageable. Mm -hmm. um, there were scenes I don't remember because mm -hmm. I was blackout drunk. There were things that I did when I watched back. I just went, oh, no. Mm. Um, we were coming back from a cast trip, and production had to beg the flight attendants to let me on the plane because I was so drunk. And, you know... I, they filmed me passed out in a stranger's lap. I mean, it wasn't pretty. And I would laugh it off of, oh, I'm just having fun. But when you're walking around day three of a cast trip with a bottle of tequila in your purse, drinking it straight, that's not fun. Um, and I, I remember once after a, a crazy night, I'd had a weaning party. And production came to my house the next day. And I was like, oh, that's so great. We had such a good time. And uh, the producer, his name was James, was like, do you remember what happened? 
I'm like, what do you mean? We had so much fun. He's like, okay, you need to call Tamara right now because you obviously don't know what happened last night. You did not have a good time. <laughs> you know, cause I didn't remember the part where I had a full breakdown. I was crying. Like I didn't complete blacked out. So when filming stopped, um, I kind of tried to, to curtail my drinking and I couldn't, um, like every other alcoholic, you know, I would take a week off or two, or I came up with rules and I broke them all. And, um, it kind of culminated into this disastrous brunch with moms. And it wasn't my close friends. It was mom friends, women I knew, but not that well. And it was 11 o'clock in the afternoon. I showed up and I would have been drinking all night long. Because at this point I was drinking. I was hiding tequila in my closet. And I had to wake up in the middle of the night to drink because the anxiety and the shakes were so bad. And I went so that when, I, when Sean came home, my husband came home, and I smelled like tequila, I could say, oh, well, I had a cocktail at a mom's brunch, you know, because that's normal. Um, I ended up saying some really horrible things to a woman I have a lot of respect for. I really look up to her. I don't remember it. Um, but I called another woman at the, the brunch, and then the next day and I said, did I do anything that I should be ashamed of? And she's like, yeah, honey, you did. And she was kind of one of those people that always placated me and, you know, took care of me. And for her to say that, I knew it must have been really bad. So I didn't think. I wrote a text message to those moms and I said, I have a problem. I know it. I'm sorry. I'm going to get help. The next day I went to Miami uh, for a big party for a co-worker's fiance's 60th birthday. I planned on not drinking. That lasted till I landed. Mm. And that was a four-day bender that was bad. And um, I don't remember all of it, but I remember the last night. It's sort of those God-shot moments of clarity. And I went to Sean. I said, I can't stop drinking. I need help. And he sat on me, literally, with held me down because I was shaking so bad. Oh. In retrospect, I should not have done that. I now know that you can die yeah. from yeah. from the way I was drinking to, to cold turkey. So I always want to mention that to anyone that's listening. Don't do what I did. I detoxed on a plane home. I landed. My mom was there. We had had a very tumultuous relationship. A lot of it was around my drinking. And I told her, I'm, I have to get sober. I'm going to die if I keep this up. I was drinking every 15 minutes around the clock at that point. And... Um, I didn't have a drink since that. That was my sobriety date, January 30th, 2020. It was also my 20-year wedding anniversary. Wow. Yeah. So it was a day. Um, and that was, we started filming February 12th, so 13 days before filming started. Wow. That is incredible. So I'm going to kind of back up some things. When, okay, so when did you start drinking? And then when did you start to think... There was a problem. I started drinking at 14. I grew up, like Jason, I grew up in Laguna Beach. We had a lot of freedom as kids. Uh, I had my first beer at a beach called Rock Pile the summer before freshman year. Like, I remember it so vividly. I remember who was there. Mm. I remember it was warm, Keystone. I mean, <laughs> I remember it because I was always such an insecure kid. I never felt comfortable. I never felt like I fit in. And that first drink, it was like... Oh, okay. Th I feel good now. This is it. This is what's been missing. And then I just kept drinking. And I would drink even at that young age till I threw up or passed out. So I And I didn't know that wasn't normal. I feel like a lot of people I was around were kind of doing the same thing. None of us drank responsibly. Um, I was living with my grandfather and he was older. So I didn't have the supervision that a lot of kids had at that time. Um... After my freshman year, my mom realized there was a problem that I was going down. I went from like a straight A student to like C's. I was sneaking out. Um, so she sent me to boarding school, you know, with the firm warning that if you get kicked out, you're headed to military school. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's not going to work for me. I really like makeup. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went to boarding school, which it's, you know, looking back, you have a bunch of kids with very little supervision, a lot of extra money whose parents aren't around. And so my drinking kind of became other stuff. That's when I started dabbling in, you know, ecstasy and cocaine and, you know, all of this. And we, 
I will say the people I went to boarding school with, they partied hard, but they also studied hard. So everyone went to college. Everyone's very successful, but I never grew out of that. So when I went to college, it was all about the parties. I mean, class was secondary to me. I had no desire to be there. And I met my husband, I think my second month of college, and I dropped out two months later. I was like, okay, done. I found a husband. I'm good. And then my drinking and partying kind of stayed that way until I got pregnant at 22. And I do think for sure. And I think at that point, I still didn't realize I had a problem because I was so young. Mm -hmm. And everyone was, it just seemed normal at the time. Yeah. So then I had children. I had a lot of children and I didn't drink much when I was procreating. Um, And then Jacob, my third son, uh, when he turned two and I weaned him, Sean and I had been broke our whole lives. And we were finally making money. We could finally travel. We could get a nanny. Like we were like kids in a candy store. And then we started going to Vegas and we started partying. And that's when I knew I had a problem. That was... I think the first time I tried to get sober, I kind of blew up my life. We were living in San Diego and I did some really bad things that affected other people and we moved in two weeks. And then I just kept pulling a geographic. I'd go to one town, drink too much, realize I have to get sober. We were in DC. The first time I uh, reached out for help, I was admitted to the psych ward um, because my drinking had gotten so bad that I was suicidal and I couldn't Mm. move. And that was the first time I tried to get sober. I think it lasted for maybe eight months. And then I relapsed. And then now we're in Miami, which is not the best place to get sober. (laughs) (laughs) It is possible. Um, I went to, you know, support meetings there. There is a great community of sober people there, but I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. So um, I I, I went back to rehab uh, and that lasted for seven years, but I was also having babies at the time. So I think instead of doing the work and figuring out why I was drinking, I just was like, I'm just going to have another baby, you know, and I don't have to think about it. I think we got an idea about your moment of clarity uh, when you were going a little too hard and you reached out about needing help. Um, My curiosity would be, how is that received? I mean, when we're talking about uh, with most of the people that we have on here, it's usually within a personal circle or, you know, friends, family, this and that. But to add in the layer of TV production, I mean, there had to have been a curveball or a monkey wrench or something there. Or maybe they were trying. I, I mean, hopefully not. But I know in the past, some TV shows have tried to throw fuel on the fire and instigate things. So how was that received by the people around you at the time? Um, the The production company, Evolution, was... I mean, I get teary-eyed thinking about what they did for me. They have had my back the entire time. Um, There was one scene. I was 30 days sober, and I was at a party. It wasn't going well for me. Like, everyone was kind of coming at me in housewife style, you know. And I, I think I told two people, maybe one on my cast at that point, that I was an alcoholic. And someone said something really awful to me. Just go to the bar, bro, and have another drink. You're, you know, you've effing drunk, go have a drink. And I threw a glass. I said, I'm 30 days sober. I wasn't getting help at this point. I was trying to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. My ego was so big that I thought, oh, I can't reach out. People will know, like, who cares who I am? Like, no one does. But I was still so in my head. So I didn't have any support yet. I was doing it on my own. Um, And so I spiraled that day. Um, I was in walking distance from my cast member's home. I went home. Production followed me. I tried to kick him out of the house. Um, and I was kicking them out of the house cause I was planning on drinking that day. And the producer put down the camera and he said, we can't tell you what to do or change anything, but I want you to know that we're going to roll these cameras. And if you take a drink, you're going to have to do it in front of me and Mary and Pablo. And I was like, Okay, I can't do that to them. Like, I really care about these people. We work with them so much. Like, I yeah. I can't do this to them. So then I had the brilliant idea. I said, okay, well, I'm going to go to a support meeting in my head thinking, no, I'm not. I'm going to the bar, but you can't follow me there. Ha ha. I outsmarted you. And I get in the car and uh, the producer gets in the car with the producer cam, follows me. And I just remember <laughs> looking at him I'm like, what? <laughs> you can't do this. Comes with me and Sean. Sean can't find parking. 
So he obviously he's not filming now. He puts the cameras off and he says, do you want me to go in with you? And I was shaking. And I said, yes, please. We're sitting down. We go around the room and uh, he says, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. <gasps> oh, gosh. Wow. And um, <laughs> um, that was the moment that I released and accepted and went, okay, I need help and I'm going to take it. Like I'm on my knees. I don't know what to do. This is bigger than me. And I really gave, I gave it, a, I gave it over. So at that point, it sounds wow. like you completely surrendered. Completely. Um, just for the, the, the individuals that may be, you know, curious about entering into recovery, how did that make you feel when you fully accepted and surrendered? So good. I don't know if I can describe it, but it's like you have, you're, you're carrying this weight and you hand it over to someone. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like everyone that was in that room with me took a little piece of that weight for me. Like, you don't have to do this on your own. Yeah. And it was like, and I cried. I, I, and at that point I'd been crying and I couldn't stop crying. I was just crying all the time. And I asked a woman there, I said, how long does this last, the crying? She's like, about a year. And then I felt normal because I was feeling insane. Like, why am I not, I'm sober. I haven't had a drink in 30 days. Why am I not better? And it's, it's just like, no, this is, this is where the work begins. And then I was ready to accept it. You know, there's, um, like I earned my seat there and, uh, it just felt like home. So beautiful. So after that point, wow. what was the next step for you? Mm. Um, well, you know, I was working, I was raising kids. I, um, realized I needed help more than I could do on my own. And so I, you know, started a, a program of recovery that worked for me. Um, I got someone to guide me through that. Um, keep in mind, this is all happening in March of 2020. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, you know, um, until then with filming, like we did a cast trip, they gave me time to go to get to meetings. Like they penciled that in. They drove me. They, they really did take care of me. Oh, um, I love so that. I have given, I have heard horror stories about other production companies that was never my experience. They really supported me 100%. Um, but then the world shut down. Mm -hmm. And my meeting shut down. And so I'm at home. I have, at this point, I had eight kids at home because my daughter came home from college with her boyfriend. So I'm at home with eight kids. I'm newly sober. I don't have the tools yet to know what to do. Um, I'm trying to keep everyone calm because it, it, March of 2020 was scary for, was. you know, like there was a lot of fear and here I am the mother and I'm trying to keep everyone like, it's fine. We're fine. Everything's fine. Meanwhile, I'm crying in my bed alone for so many reasons. Um, I'm self-recording all of this because production had stopped. We'd gone dark and they'd asked us to film. So I'm doing confessionals with my cell phone, which when I watch them back, I can't believe it's the same person. I mean, I was broken. I was low. And here I'm trying to put on a happy front. Um, and then I had another dark moment. I had not gotten rid of all the alcohol in my house at that point. I'd kept some around for parties and friends and, you know, cause I didn't want my, my disease to, you know, put anyone out. I was mm -hmm. still, you know, trying to think of others and make the fact that I was an alcoholic comfortable for everyone else. And, um, I called my girlfriend at like 1130 at night. I'm in my garage in front of the fridge with a bottle of wine. And I'm like, she been the, she'd been sober for 23 years. And I said, I, I need help. I can't. I'm going to drink. And she said, no, you're going to make it till tomorrow morning. And then I'm coming over. And she came over every day. And then she helped me find Zoom meetings. Yeah. And then slowly I started to find support. Um, during all of this time period. We have a global pandemic. My husband has an affair. I fall in love with my best friend. My daughter tries to kill herself. Wow. This was in an, a month of my life. And I remember going to Zoom meetings on the floor, unable to move, crying hysterically, and just getting to that meeting, someone had gone through what I had gone through. 
I didn't have to know how to get through the next minute or second. Cause I, there was moments where I didn't even know if I could get through the next second. Um, but once I got to a meeting, someone had been through it. Someone had the, the advice or the knowledge or whatever. I didn't have to do this alone. I had a community of people that had been through everything worse than this and gotten through it sober. And so, um, I mean, I, I, and even now looking back, I'm like, I can't believe I did that. Like, I can't believe I got through some of those things and I didn't drink. Like, that's everything. Cause I know, and we all know this now, but like at the moment I thought drinking would make it better. We all know that's not true. Drinking's just going it, to, it's still going to be a horrible, you're just going to be drunk and hungover. Wow. Right. So talking about uh solution and, you know, changing gears slightly, um, it sounded like those meetings were really beneficial for you. Having that support network of people that you felt like you could disperse some of that weight was helpful. Um, what other tools or tricks or, you know, program trades do you have that may be able to help somebody that, I mean, last year was rough for a lot of people. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it, it's nice to have somebody that, um, was able to get some solution during that time because I feel like last year for those that were really struggling, the ones that were able to adapt their program or their personal recovery were able to really surplant some roots to really grow on uh, versus before, you know, people had a program and then when in-person meetings and the meeting rooms completely shut down or this or that, um, a lot of people I felt like were almost floundering looking for the next step. I will say, honestly, podcasts like this, this is, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't allowed to talk about my sobriety yet because we were still filming and this is technically storyline and we're, you know, we signed contracts of what we're allowed to talk about. So I went online, I went on Instagram, I found, that's how I found Jason, you know, like I knew of him obviously, cause he's been on TV, but I knew he was sober. I was like, Ooh, click follow. And I started listening, you know, <laughs> um, Alexis Haynes follow. I started following sober people on Instagram because that became my community. You know, I, I had to, to get a little more creative, uh, in, in what I was doing. Social media has its ups and downs. You know, we all know that, but I think during this pandemic for people in recovery, it has been such a blessing. So I found what I needed online. That was, I think, such a blessing to me. Um, I read books, I mean, there's some literature that we all know about, but then I, I found other books. Glennon Doyle wrote a book called Untamed, uh, where she talks about her addiction and recovery. And I was like, okay, I'm not alone. You know, there's other women out there that have gone through this. Um, and then just personally, I, I realize that when I exercise and I meditate and I take time to myself, those are all very helpful. I have a tendency to overcommit myself and, um, I said something on the show and, and people took it the wrong way. I said, I'm going to put myself first. And it, it, the backlash was, but you have children, how, you're so selfish. I said, that's not what I mean. What I mean is I'm going to say yes to the things that keep me sober. I'm not going to overcommit myself. I'm not going to burn the candle at both ends like I've always done. I'm going to take that time out and I'm going to put my sobriety first because I'm not a good mom if I'm drunk. Mm -hmm. You know, the best gift I can give to my children, to my family, to my community, to anyone is staying sober. Because sober Bronwyn is a lot better than drunk Bronwyn, you know? Yes. And so just kind of putting up those boundaries. I lost some people. I lost a lot of people. But they those relationships weren't real. They weren't based on things that were important to me anymore, you know? My old drinking buddies fell to the wayside. And that's better. Totally. Yeah. So on, uh, you know, setting boundaries and things like that, Jason wanted me to ask something that we thought you did that was a little different and interesting, but it involves your scheduling. So in setting up boundaries, uh, I believe you had mentioned something or he had mentioned something that you set up your schedule for the following day. So, you know, everything's scheduled and booked out, but you don't look at it until it comes. Right. So we were talking last night and he, we were talking about today. I said, well, I don't, I haven't looked at tomorrow until tomorrow. I know I'm doing stuff, but so I have someone that, that helps me with my scheduling and does all this stuff. And then every morning he sends it to me I'm like, okay, obviously like birthdays I know are coming up, but for the most part, I just take it one day at a time. And I don't just say that I live that because with my kids stuff 
and, you know, work things and fa- I mean, family, travel, whatever. I can get overwhelmed if I looked at my whole week. If I looked at what I did every week, I'd be like, no, that's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. But when I take it day by day, I'm like, okay, I can do that. And obviously I, ha- I have someone that understands I have a timeline and, you know, it's, it's doable. But if I think about all the things that need to be done in the day, I will get overwhelmed. If I think about, you know, for the whole week or the month, but okay, today, what am I doing today? Okay, I can do that. And then I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. That's wonderful. That is absolutely that. wonderful. That, that's great. You know, <laughs> just keep it all in check and in line and yeah. just tackle it as it comes. That, that's it. Well, we have a, another question that we ask. If you were to give our listeners one action for the day, what would it be? Wow. That's a, that's a big question. Um, I think that if you are sober, the one action for the day would be to ask yourself, what can I do for someone else today? Mm. Um, yes. For sure. That has been my saving grace is doing for others. I think if you are sober curious. Sober curious. I love it. <laughs> you know, um, the one thing that I would recommend you do is imagine all of the things that you want in your life. And then realize if you stop drinking, you can have them Mm. and make a list. I want to, you know, for me, it was, I want to be a good mom. I want to write a book. I want to be able to give back. I couldn't do any of those things when I was drinking and they're all happening now. So if you're sober, give back. If you're sober, curious, make a list of everything you want. And then know if you put that drink down, you can have it. Wow. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Thank you. And I know our listeners are so excited to um, hear more about you and you guys, well, you guys can see us on camera now since we've been doing the video. So you can see how gorgeous she is. She's, she doesn't even look like she's had a baby. <laughs> I'm like, okay, after this, I'm going to get the tips and the tricks of the trade. I'm not sharing. Until later. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm so glad yeah, to be and here. if our listeners want to catch up with you on Instagram or on the internet, where's the best place that they can find you? So my Instagram is my name, Bronwyn Windenberg. In full disclosure, I don't run that anymore. Part of my self care was to take a step back from social media. So I have someone else that that is doing that. Um, I do something called Amplified Voices where I, I interview other people. And then I also do under that umbrella, mental health Zooms every month. So if you want to see me and talk to me every month, I am there the last Sunday of every month for an hour. And, you know, ask me anything, share, relate, find a community. It's been a really great, great part of this whole, this whole pandemic was a community that I've been able to start. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on and we'll have the the links to those websites below. So if our viewers want to check those out, hopefully they'll pay you a visit on the last Sunday of the month because it sounds like something I would like to check out. Uh, Anything else you'd like to add on, Hillary, before we let our guest go? I just want to thank you for sharing such uh, deep things that you went through, especially in the beginning, kind of what your heart went through and the pandemic and your kids. I mean, just all of that. It was so um, transparent and beautiful and Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Having me. Thanks, everybody.